Further debate? I recognize the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good afternoon. I'm pleased to speak to this important piece of legislation today, introduced by my good friend, the Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. This bill and its proposed changes is another crucial step forward in our government's plan to modernize regulations, reduce unnecessary burdens, and digitize processes to help more people and businesses recover from the economic effects of COVID-19 and prepare them for the opportunities of the future. If passed, the Act would strengthen economic recovery, help businesses and government adapt and create the conditions for investment and prosperity over the long term. We will cut costly red tape to help businesses and people increase cash flow, invest in safety measures, and rebuild. We will reduce unnecessary and duplicative requirements for private and public sector businesses and organizations to save time and streamline how government works. And we will have modern regulations that are easy to understand and comply with. This will allow people and businesses to invest time and money in what's important, recovering, rebuilding, and re-emerging from the crisis stronger than before. This bill is the Better for People and Smarter for Business Act. Like the bill of the same name introduced last year, we are introducing proposals to benefit both people interacting with government as individuals and businesses interacting with government as companies, as employers. <clears throat> The past several months have underlined how now more than ever, government, people, and businesses need to be able to modernize and adapt. Taking advantage of technology and streamlining antiquated processes and practices. This bill is a step in that direction. This is also another piece in our overall response to COVID-19. Right away, our government took action to make 10 billion dollars in financial relief available to people and businesses. Speaker, 1.9 billion in employer relief by allowing WSIB payments to be deferred for up to six months. 1.8 billion in property tax deferrals for individuals and businesses. And six billion dollars in relief through an interest and penalty-free payment on most provincial taxes. These relief measures were introduced through Ontario's action plan responding to COVID-19. This was the first economic and fiscal update of any province during the pandemic. We have taken concrete steps to protect the people of Ontario, as well as our economy throughout the pandemic. And while we are hearing of positive news about the development of vaccines, we know that the pandemic will still be with us for some time yet. We must continue to support people and businesses throughout the pandemic, while also keeping long-term recovery and economic growth in mind. It is a balancing act. Speaker, I'm proud of the people of Ontario, especially the people of my community of Mississauga Streetsville, in how far we've come. And then I'm proud of my colleagues in government for the actions we have taken. While we are working hard to reduce red tape and regulatory burden, we realize that changes must be done methodically and strategically. We are not against regulation. We are against unnecessary regulation. There are guiding principles that we follow when proposing amendments or changes. One, we must protect health, safety, and the environment. Our government will only ease regulatory burden in a smart, careful way to ensure that health, safety, and environmental protections are maintained. We must prioritize issues that are most important, even if they are difficult. We are carefully assessing which regulations cost people and businesses the most time and money while looking for innovative, modern ways to ensure these rules are effective and efficient as possible. After all, it is the 21st century. We must do what we can to harmonize rules with Ottawa and other provinces 
wherever we can. Rules and regulations should not vary widely between Ontario and other provinces or the federal government. We're targeting duplicative red tape and aligning where we can to make things easier for people and job creators. Speaker, we must listen to the people of Ontario. We want to hear from people about what we can do to remove red tape and create the right conditions for businesses and communities to prosper. Most importantly, we must take an all-of-government approach to regulations and problem-solving. Once and for all, we need to end the silo approach and recognize that regulations don't fall only under one ministry. They span across many, or even the entire government in some cases. This is why we're taking a highly coordinated approach and making sure everyone in government is on the same page when it comes to our red tape reduction strategy. Speaker, first I'd like to talk about people. We've taken action to support people before this piece of legislation. One of the biggest examples was in response to the panic buying that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic. We all experienced the shortages of toilet paper, canned goods, and even staples like flour. Our supply chain partners assured us we were not at risk of shortages, but stock could not be replenished quickly enough. In response, we allowed trucks to start making deliveries 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have seen the difference this has made, and people's confidence that they can buy the things their families rely on has been restored. But let's talk about this legislation. We have heard from many who were concerned about the processes for companies to build new wells or extract water, so immediately we took a review. Our review of Ontario's water taking program found that takings for bottled water are managed effectively under the current framework, but it was clear that local communities wanted more say in decisions to allow bottling in their area. Keeping in line with our actions throughout the pandemic, we are proposing a change to require that municipalities support bottlers' applications for new or increased water takings before submitting to the province. And here's an example of regulatory practice we propose to update in order to reflect options that didn't exist when the regulations were written. This would modernize practices for child and uh, spousal support payments by introducing new payment options. Currently, employers are required to deduct the amount an employee owes from their pay and forward it to the Family Responsibility Office, or FRO. This method reflected the payment options available in 1996 when the Family Responsibility and Support Areas Enforcement Act came into effect. But we now have reliable and automatic payment options, such as pre-authorized debit and online banking, that weren't readily available 24 years ago. This proposal under Schedule 4 of the bill would give the FROS director the discretion to offer support payers new options like this to pay what they owe. This wouldn't mean that everyone would switch to one of the new payment options. Instead, FRO would allow support payers to use different payment methods in appropriate cases. And it would monitor these cases closely for compliance. And in these cases, employers would also be relieved of the administrative burden of deducting support payments from an employee's pay. I'm going to talk a little about medications at border towns. I'd like to highlight an action that would benefit Ontarians who live in towns bordering Manitoba and Quebec, and are treated by a doctor or nurse practitioner from one of those provinces. The proposal would turn a successful pilot launched in 2015 into a permanent regulatory practice. Under this pilot, healthcare professionals in Manitoba or Quebec, with patients across the border in Ontario, are designated as authorized prescribers under the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. This allows them to submit drug approval requests under the program on behalf of their patients. Making this approach permanent 
will expand access for people in border towns to the medications they so desperately need. It's an example of a common sense change that would have a positive impact on Ontarians. Another action would address significant gaps in vital transportation services, inter-community buses. Buses are a lifeline for people in many communities, especially in rural and northern Ontario. Rural and northern Ontarians rely on the bus to get to hospitals, to go to work, or access post-secondary education. But there are significant gaps in this service. And COVID-19 has widened those gaps as bus carriers have responded to decreased demand by reducing or even discontinuing services on many routes. We're proposing to address these gaps by deregulating the intercommunity bus sector to allow new entrants into the market. This would create an open and competitive market that would support economic recovery. It would permit new carriers to offer improved service for residents in rural and northern communities. For example, they would be allowed to introduce innovations such as using smaller buses on routes where that would match lower demand from passengers. Deregulating the inter-community bus sector would also benefit existing carriers by providing them with more regulatory flexibility as they continue to restart service. It would give them the scope to retool their service offerings in response to demand of their own financial capabilities. We're also proposing changes to protect students attending private career colleges. The proposed actions concern government oversight of a fund that provides protection for students if a private career college suddenly closes or loses its registration status. The Training Completion Assurance Fund, or TCAF, ensures that if this happens, eligible students can complete their training at another institution or get a partial refund of their fees. Currently, an advisory board provides recommendations on matters related to this fund to the superintendent of private career colleges. But our agency review task force recommended replacing this board with an advisory committee. This is a more flexible model, and it's widely used because it simplifies the process for selecting committee members. Adopting this model would ensure we continue to receive advice in this important area, but in a, a more nimble and flexible manner. And now I'd like to talk about the other half of our bill, businesses. In July, we took several major steps to reduce regulatory burdens as part of the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act. Through this legislation, we've combined all burden reduction requirements into a single law, the Modernizing Ontario for People and Businesses Act. This new law includes two key advances in our work in this area. The first is to enshrine the government's seven burden reduction principles into law. These principles are, one, use industry standards or international best practices. Two, apply a small business lens. Three, go digital. Four, strengthen risk-based inspections. Five, create a tell us once culture. Six, focus on the user. And seven, focus regulations on the desired outcomes. Provincial ministries are now required to consider these principles as they develop proposals for regulatory changes. The second key advance is to broaden the scope of our work substantially. It now encompasses legislation, regulations, policies, and forms. We all know how much we love filling out forms. We've also extended it to regulatory requirements that affect the for-profit sector, not-for-profit organizations, or the broader public sector. Speaker, as I had mentioned before, we have done lots of work to provide supports and flexibility during COVID-19, but our work is not yet complete. This new legislation would strengthen economic recovery, 
help businesses and government better adapt and create the conditions for investment and prosperity over the long term. The Act would do this in three ways. It would cut costly red tape to boost our recovery by helping businesses increase cash flow, invest in safety measures, and rebuild. It would reduce unnecessary and duplicative requirements for businesses to save time and streamline how government works, supporting businesses and government transformation. It would modernize regulations and digitize to increase innovation and prepare people and businesses for the opportunities of the future, promoting investment and growth. The proposals in our legislation would make a tangible difference for businesses in many spheres of our communities, including changes to regulations that affect the aquaculture and mining exploration sectors, real estate transactions, redevelopment of brownfield sites, and decision-making at business corporations. Let's start off with corporate decision-making. One of our proposals would allow privately held business corporations to make decisions requiring shareholder approval through an ordinary resolution faster and more cost-effectively. This amendment would apply to written shareholder resolutions to approve certain types of corporate actions, such as adopting new bylaws, appointing an auditor, or electing directors. Currently, companies must spend time and money obtaining signatures from every voting shareholder. And some of these resolutions fail because companies can't collect the signatures within the timeline required under the Business Corporations Act, not because shareholders are opposed. We're proposing to align with the practice in BC, Yukon, and Delaware by lowering the approval threshold from unanimous to a majority of shareholders. This wouldn't apply to special resolutions which are typical for significant corporate decisions such as amalgamations. We're proposing to align our practice with jurisdictions that are often cited as being attractive places for corporations. This would allow these businesses to make certain types of decisions more quickly so they could capitalize on the opportunities and avoid missing out on opportunities due to burdensome approval processes. Overall, this would help strengthen a pro-investment business environment in Ontario that would help create good jobs. One of the things I strongly believe is that learning from experience. And that's why I'm particularly pleased about this next action. We will be applying what our public servants have learned from administering legislation on forfeited corporate properties to improve the system overall. When the Forfeited Corporate Property Act came into effect in 2016, it consolidated the management of these properties with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. This year, the Ministry completed a review of 332 files on forfeited properties over the first three years under this Act and identified ways to improve the regulatory process. Our proposed amendments to the Act would reduce burdens on people, businesses and government. They would remove duplication and clarify requirements to make it easier for consumers and businesses to seek relief from forfeiture or to buy a forfeited property. Similarly, we are making housekeeping amendments to provisions in the Planning Act about what's known as subdivision control. These provisions ensure proper government oversight when land is divided into subdivisions. The government evaluates a proposal to create a parcel of land to ensure it adheres to land use planning principles and addresses any long-term impacts from creating the parcel. These highly technical amendments would help make the subdivision control provisions in the Planning Act clearer and reduce unnecessary administrative burdens. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to outline all of our proposals and amendments within the bill, but they are all common sense changes to enhance our province's regulatory effectiveness and efficiency and improve the environment for people and businesses. I look forward to supporting this bill. I ask all of the people in the chamber to support this bill and I thank the minister for bringing this forward. Thank you, speaker. I recognize the government house leader on a point of order. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, if you seek it, I'm sure you will find unanimous consent to move a motion without notice respecting Bill 61, an act to proclaim Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Mr. Calandra is seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without notice respecting Bill 61, an act to proclaim Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Agreed? Agreed. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move uh, that the order of the House dated December 6, 2018, referring Bill 61, an act to proclaim Eating Disorders, Eating Disorders Awareness Week to the Standing Committee on General Government be discharged, and the bill be instead referred to the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly. Mr. Calander has moved that the order of the House dated December 6, 2018, referring Bill 61, an act to proclaim Eating Disorders Awareness Week to the Standing Committee on General Government be discharged and the bill be instead referred to the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Yeah. Uh, carry. Questions and comments? I recognize the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. And I have a question for the uh, member for um, St uh, Mississauga Streetsville. I know a little bit about Mississauga because I used to teach at UTM, and a quick glance at her riding tells me there are a fair number of mosques in the riding, which tells me a fair number of her constituents are Muslim. And I would like to know, as we're talking about this bill, how those constituents feel about this bill containing a schedule that legislates more Islamophobia into Ontario with the granting of Charles McVitie uh, the ability to grant degrees and Islamophobic curriculum. Thank you. Response? Member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for her question. Um, Speaker, this bill, the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, it relates to many areas of our how we can get our province moving again. The, the item that the uh, member opposite is talking about, we want to make sure that everybody is equal unto the law. No one is above the law, no one is beneath the law, and no one is beyond the law. And therefore, we must make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to apply through the government to anything that's available to them. And that's what we have done in this legislation. Thank you. Question, I recognize <laughs> A whole bunch of you. Um, I recognize the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for speaking on this bill. Some of the people that I have spoken to in my community of Scarborough Centre don't have a clear understanding of what red tape is or why we need to address Ontario's overregulation in order to help our small businesses who are clearly struggling right now. Can you tell me why addressing red tape and regulatory burdens is so important to the people of Ontario? Response, member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, and thank you to the member. Um, speaker, these are very unprecedented times, and businesses really need help to recover from the economic effects of COVID-19 whilst also preparing for the future. Red tape hurts job creators' ability to do what they do best, create jobs. We need to help them create jobs as we continue the path down recovery. The Better for People, Smarter for Business Act 2020, if passed, will strengthen Ontario's economic recovery, support businesses on the ground, and will help government deliver clear and effective rules that promote public health and safeguard the environment without sacrificing innovation, growth, and opportunity. Modern regulations that are easier to understand and comply with would allow people Response. and businesses to invest time and money in what's important right now, recovering, rebuilding and re-emerging from this crisis stronger than before. Thank you. Further question, I recognize the member from Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank the member from Mississauga Streets, Bill, um, for her perspective on the bill. Um, I understand that you feel that this is going to help small businesses in your community, um, but when I speak to those small businesses across the Peel region, as we're both members in Peel, um, one of the biggest burdens that they're facing is the increasing cost of insurance, and your government has the power to regulate those rates. Can you help us understand why those types of measures are not included in this bill or any other bill that your government has brought forward? Thank you. Response? Member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. In fact, this is an, an industry I take, I have a lot of knowledge about, and, uh, and unfortunately, the, the member opposite is incorrect. Um, although we're not talking about it in this bill, the budget bill 
does recognize uh, areas of insurance by making it easier for more competitors in insurance industries and, and about talking about many areas where people can choose coverages that they want. That bill is still to come to the floor and to be finalized, and we will talk about it more in that bill. But insurance is a very complicated product. product. It's very difficult. I encourage everyone out there, when your policy comes up for renewal or even before that, to shop around. Check with your brokers, check with other companies, look at the options that are available to you. There are many companies here, but we do want to make sure that we encourage Response. much more competition so that we can help the people of Ontario have more affordable insurance premiums. Thank you. Further question? I recognize the member from Niagara West. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for Mississauga Streetsville for speaking to this legislation today. I'm wondering if the member can speak a little bit about Schedule 12 of the bill, and that, of course, is the changes to the Niagara Parks Commission, which allow the parks to uh, ensure that an auditor is appointed who does not have to go through the lieutenant governor in council process. And I know that this is because they've had times in the past where just due to the schedules of everything moving through uh, cabinet, it's been difficult for them to ensure that they actually have in place someone to do the auditing. And we obviously want to make sure that the agencies that are uh, governmental are, of course, being audited and that their finances are in order. So could you talk to a little bit about this process as well as uh, some of the changes that have been made uh, to ensure that uh, there can be direct delivery for many small businesses of alcohol sales. I know it's benefited wineries in Niagara West as well as other restaurants. Question. Response? Member from Niagara. No. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. August Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Niagara West for the question. I think it's extremely crucial and very, very important that when we're modernizing our regulations, uh, that once we did it with the input of the local authorities and to make sure, especially in the areas of Niagara Parks, where we really wanted to make sure we had their input in what was best for their communities. Uh, and, and when we talk about the red tape and regulatory burden, um, Ontario has to work better for people and it has to work better for all of our businesses. Businesses today, they need urgent and meaningful help. And as we look for those opportunities to modernize these regulations and also reduce red tape, our government is committed to those five guiding principles that I talked about earlier. And uh, that, of course, is the health and safety and environmental protections that must be maintained and they must be enhanced. And when I said before, all of our common sense approach to these regulations is critical to make sure that we can get things moving faster and in the right way. Further questions? A member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Did you know there's a law in Ontario? that says your kids on a street corner can't sell lemonade unless they have a five-acre lemon tree orchard. I'm just pulling your leg. There is no such law. But in Ontario, you can't sell craft cider unless you own a five-acre orchard. Complete red tape. I applaud the government for lifting that restriction during these COVID years or months or days. But I say, Speaker, the member from Mississauga Streetsville, who started off by saying this is the 21st century after all. Do you agree that it is time to lift the res restriction, the five acre orchard restriction, on craft brewers who want to sell craft cider in cans out, out the door? Question. Because it just makes no more sense in the 21st century to have a five acre orchard when you're using Ontario apples to sell your cider. Response, member from Mississauga Streets. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I think it's very critical that we listen to the people who are providing and, and manufacturing the ciders that we all love. I know we all do on this side of the house. <laughs> um, and, and it's critical that we can get it to market. And, and, if we, and if we as a government are in their way of being able to, uh, to get that product to market, then we're not acting as a good government. So we have been listening to them wholeheartedly. We are listening to ha find ways that we can do things better. And that is something I know that our government has been listening to, and we will be hopefully further acting on that in the future. Thank you. Further question? The member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. I recently hosted a virtual roundtable with uh, members of the Whitby Chamber of Commerce and the Recovery Committee from the region of Durham. And then it was a cross-section of businesses. And we spoke about ways in which to create jobs, ways to lead the recovery. So what I'd like the, the member of Mississauga 
member from Mississauga and Streetsville uh, to speak about those features of this legislation that are helping small businesses, not only in the town of Whitby and across the region of Durham, uh, create those good jobs and lead the way to recovery. Thank you, Speaker. Response, <coughs> member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member for the question. This pandemic has really, really shown us how government needs to take the lead and be stronger and take action to modernize and digitize how we've done things. Technology has come to the forefront during this pandemic, as we've all seen, uh, most of us doing many of our meetings via Zoom or Teams or other ways. But business today, they need help now. They need it urgently. So we, through this legislation, want to help deliver the clear, current and effective rules that maintain and enhance our public health, our safety, our environment. And uh, we have to modernize those regulations and reduce red tape. So that's why our government is committed to getting this done. The Better for People, Smarter for Business Act 2020 will strengthen, and if it's passed, it will strengthen our Ontario's economic recovery, support these businesses on the ground, and help government deliver clear and effective rules that promote public health and safeguard our environment without sacrificing innovation, growth, Thank you. and opportunity. Thank you. Further debate? I recognize the member for London North Centre. 